Lords of Waterdeep is a 2-5 player Euro style game set in the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Now we've seen a few board games set in this universe somewhat recently, but this game takes a very unique approach to the theme of Dungeons and Dragons, or the typical theme of Dungeons and Dragons, because players are not adventurers in this game, instead they are Lords of Waterdeep. And what this means is they're essentially rulers of a city, kind of vying for supremacy. So the players in this game will actually be the individuals that the adventurers will come to to be assigned a quest. And that's all worked into the game, which I think is a really, really nice twist on the theme. Now during the game, aside from assigning adventurers to quests, players will also be developing the city of Waterdeep together, investing in new buildings, which offer new actions to all of the player's agents. Basically in gamers' terms, we're looking at a worker placement game, where the action spaces, which are the buildings, can be owned by players. So when I use an action space that you own, you will get a reward. So owning desirable buildings is, can be a really wise investment in this game because the more people use them, the more you can gain. Resource management though, I'd have to say, is the biggest part. And in this game, adventurers are the resources that you'll be gathering. And once you have a set of them, you can send them out on a quest to complete it. Completed quests are worth victory points, some buildings provide victory points, and there are also a few other ways throughout the game that you can get some victory points. The player after 8 rounds with the most amount of victory points will win, so with that said, let's check out Lords of Waterdeep. At the start of the game, players will each choose a faction to play and take the appropriate building control markers, agent meeples, and player's mat. Each faction in the game acts the same as one another. However, the lords in charge of running these factions are not the same. Each player will be randomly dealt one of these lord cards at the beginning of the game. These cards specify a secret objective to get bonus victory points after the game ends. For the most part, they'll have players seek to complete certain types of quests. For example, here we have Mert the Moneylender. At the end of the game, if Mert is a lord of your faction, you'll get an extra 4 victory points for each commerce and piety quest that you've completed. Next we'll have a look at the quest cards. Here we have a commerce quest, and in order to complete this quest, you must pay one white cube, one orange cube, one black cube, and four gold, which gold is indicated by this icon here. As you can see, the icons used in the game are very intuitive. The graphic design really makes this game quite easy to teach to newcomers. Now the cubes in the game actually represent adventurers. Orange are the fighters, white are the clerics, black of the rogues, and purple of the wizards. So this particular quest actually requires a cleric, a fighter, a rogue, and four gold to complete. Of course, if you complete a quest by paying its required costs, you'll be rewarded. The reward you'll get for completing this particular quest is nine victory points, which is what this icon means. As part of the reward, you'll also get four rogues to add to your stock. Now, aside from commerce quests, there are also warfare, skullduggery, Arcana, and Piety quests as well. They all range in how difficult they are to complete and offer different rewards, such as this quest, which has a reward of 6 victory points, and then whenever you buy a building, you'll get another 4 victory points, so that one actually has a lasting effect. This quest here will reward the player with 14 victory points, they'll get 2 fighters, then it also allows them to play an intrigue card immediately. What are intrigue cards? Well, intrigue cards can be played only at certain times throughout the game, and these cards can do a variety of things such as see you take adventurers or gold from the stock, return an already assigned agent meeple of yours back to your pool of agents so you can use him again, which that can be quite useful. Intrigue cards can also see you steal an adventurer off an opponent, take four money from the stock, and then you also have to choose an opponent to receive two money. Or, there are even mandatory quests which you can assign to an opponent and they must complete that quest before completing any other quest, so it basically hinders their plans a bit. Alright, so now I've explained what the quest and intrigue cards do and how they work, but how do you get them in the first place? Well, you do that through assigning your agent meeples to buildings. In a player's turn, a player can assign one agent to a building, take the action the building provides, then complete a quest if they have the appropriate resources to do so. Players continue taking turns in this fashion until every player runs out of agents to place, at which point the round ends. Let's have a look at what happens when you assign an agent to some of the buildings that are printed on the board. Each building in the game has a space with a meeple printed on it. Most buildings only have enough space 
for one agent meeple to occupy. In most cases, if that space is already occupied by a meeple, you can't place a meeple of your own there. Let's start this off by having a look at the Realm Shop here. By placing an agent at the Realm Shop, you'll immediately receive four gold. Fairly simple stuff. Over at the Black Staff Tower, if you place an agent here, you'll get one purple cube, which again, purple cubes are the wizards. Over here at the Field of Triumph, you'll get two fighters. At the Grinning Lion Tavern, you'll get two rogues. And here at the Plinth, you'll get one cleric. Now, the castle here is a bit different. Here you'll get an intrigue card, and you'll also get the start player token from whoever has it. Being the start player for a round in this game can be greatly beneficial, as all the buildings will be vacant at the start of a round, so you can select from any of them. So keep that in mind. The castle is pretty good. Next, I'll touch on the more desirable buildings, starting with the Cliff Watch Inn. This building allows an agent to take a quest card from those displayed above. But depending on what action space you choose to go to, because there are three of them here, you will get different bonuses. At the first space, the reward is that you will take a quest card and get two gold. At the second space, it's a quest card and an intrigue card. The third space is quite interesting because it sees you scrap all the existing quests on display and bring out four new ones. Then, after the new ones come out, you can select one to take. Once a quest card is taken from the display, a new one always comes out immediately. As a note, there is no hand limit on quest or intrigue cards. The Builder's Hall is next. This space allows you to pay a cost to build one of the three buildings displayed here. You pay the cost and place the building on the board's edge, marking it with one of your ownership tokens. This is now another building put into play. Other players and yourself can use these buildings just like any other buildings. But when an agent is placed on one of these particular buildings, not only does the Meeple's owner take an action described here, but the owner of the actual building itself will also get a reward which is listed here. So investing in some of the better buildings can be wise, because the more desirable the building is for others to use, the more you as the owner of the building can benefit. Now there are 24 of these buildings in the game. Some of the actions they allow players to take are quite useful, like choose a space containing an opponent's meeple, you can then use that space's action as though you had assigned an agent there yourself. Or, they may allow you to take an adventurer of any type from the stock, and you'll also get two gold as well. However, with that particular building, the owner of the building will get two victory points if you use it, so you might be a bit hesitant to use that building at times. The next space printed on the board is the Waterdeep Harbour. Just like the Cliff Watch Inn, this building has three meeple spaces. I'll only touch briefly on this building, but it basically allows you to play one of your intrigue cards. Players will continue placing workers, gaining resources, sending adventurers out on quests until the end of the eighth round. Then players add up all their victory points and the player with the most victory points wins. Okay, so Lords of Waterdeep is very much a resource management game. Players will mostly be gathering cubes and coins and trading them in for victory points. And whilst this is not the most thematic game, I must say I do enjoy the game more because of the theme. I think it's a really neat idea to have approached the Dungeons & Dragons theme from a totally different angle. In saying that, in order to enjoy the game, it wouldn't at all be necessary to have a knowledge of D&D. I mean, I used to play D&D quite often back in the day, but mostly homemade adventures. So going into this game, I'd never heard of the City of Waterdeep or anything like that. Still, much of the theme had a familiar feel in the dealings with adventurers and the quests and so forth. Now, there can be a bit of player interaction during Lords of Waterdeep, and not just the whole, oh, you totally went where I wanted to go type of thing. The intrigue cards can see players get a little bit nasty toward one another, but the interactions are never truly damaging to an opponent. You, you, you more or less just delay your opponents achieving a goal, which I think is a good thing given the style of the game. Just one more thing I wanted to touch on, the game includes 24 buildings that may come into play, but it's likely that only 8 or 9 will come out. So each game, there will be a bit of variation with the buildings. 
but the buildings mostly offer new ways to gain resources, of course with the caveat being that the new buildings that come into play will have owners that get rewards, so you have to keep an eye on the rewards and what you're getting and sort of weigh up your options there. My point however for bringing the buildings up is that each game will not have a totally fresh feel. The buildings generally offer more attractive options to those that are printed on the board, so it's not like a new building comes out and suddenly the game changes drastically as a result of the action it offers. There are a few really, really cool buildings in the game that are quite different, but I would have liked to have seen more variation in the different styles of actions that are offered by the buildings. Lords of Waterdeep I think would work quite well in some groups as a gateway style of game. It's quite simple in terms of grasping the rules, the graphic design really helps make it accessible, it's very intuitive, and I'd say overall the gameplay just runs along really smoothly, things just move along at a good pace. But I mean, even with its simplicity, there are still times throughout the game where you're going to have to really think. You might be desperate for fighters, but the spot on the board that offers them to you is taken, so do you have an intrigue card that you can get fighters from? Is there a quest that you have that you could complete without the need for a fighter? Should you grab another quest and start on that? Maybe another intrigue card, see what that brings. Is there a building that you could bring into play that could help you out? There's a bit to take into consideration. Now the game works reasonably well with two players. I, I would play another two player game of it, which is, that's a good thing. But I think it is a better game with three or more players because there is, there's more competition and the intrigue cards, I think, are just, just more intriguing. They tend to add more to a game with three or more players. I think it's a solid game with some good things happening. I like being able to own buildings and getting rewards that way. It's, I think that's, that's something I haven't seen before in a worker placement game, and I think it creates an interesting situation. So uh, that's one reason that I'm going to be holding on to this. I also like that some victory points are hidden and some are not. So you'll have an idea of who's in the lead during the game, but at the end of the game, how well some players have done with their secret objectives can see the lead change. Which brings me to my next point, there can be quite a difference in scores. From my experience, the scoring is not all that tight. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not wild, it's just not all that tight. I quickly want to mention too, there is one Lord in the game that offers six victory points to for, for that player when they buy a building. Now it's not such a big deal with three or more players, be, because it's more likely that other people will be interested in buying buildings, but in a two player game, she can be quite powerful. The, the other player I think has to kind of abandon their goals for a few turns just to buy up some real estate, because if they don't, from my experience, the other player has the potential to just really run away with the points. And you may think, well, if the Lord cards are hidden information, how, how would I know that that Lord is in the game? I think judging by your opponent's actions, particularly with that Lord, uh, you'll get a good, of a good idea of what they're up to. So all in all, I like the game. The main reason I'll be holding on to this copy, though, it, it just... I, it's easy to introduce to people. It takes like five or ten minutes to teach, and you still feel like you've played... A fairly meaty game. I, I don't think it's the deepest game in the world, but it still feels like a, a main event. Anyway, that's my review. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all again soon.